Coming up on Triangulation, I sit down and have a chat with Yancey Strickler. He is the co-founder of Kickstarter and author of this new book, This Could Be Our Future, a manifesto for a more generous world. That's up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 420, recorded Friday, October 25th, for Friday, November 1st, 2019. Kickstarter co-founder, Yancey Strickler. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by LastPass, a personal password manager and identity solution for businesses all in one. You only need one master password, and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. It's time for Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell sitting in on the show that I just love doing when I get the opportunity to sit down with people who create the tools that I know I've used in my life and appreciated. It's just, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to meet the people behind the products that I use and I'm sure you've used as well. If you've, uh, well, everybody's familiar with Kickstarter. Uh, If you ever use Kickstarter, then I'm sure you have uh, at least this man, among others on the team, to thank. Yancey Strickler uh, is a writer, also the co-founder and former CEO of Kickstarter, and he joins us right now. Welcome to the show, Yancey. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to get you on. We have you on because you wrote... A manifesto, not just a book, but a manifesto, and I feel like that that carries an extra amount of weight when you put it that way. Uh, it's, yeah. called, it's called "This Could Be Our Future: A Manifesto for a More Generous World." And uh, yeah. I, I was telling you before the show, I love how you how you write about this topic because I, I feel like it could be a very complicated um, complicated thing to to describe and to. Uh, illustrate for people to understand these concepts, but you've been speaking to the concepts in this book for a while now, right? Since you stepped away from your CEO role at Kickstarter, is that right? Yeah, even even as a CEO, at a, at a certain point, I just began talking a lot about what I saw as the macro issues surrounding not just tech, but really all of the economy and all of society, which was this implicit belief that the right, the correct choice in any decision is whichever option makes the most money. And uh, about five years ago to the day of now, pretty much, um, I gave a talk at Web Summit in Ireland where I expressed this idea and I called it financial maximization. And I explained it by talking about watching my neighborhood, the Lower East Side in New York, get gentrified. And there are suddenly being four TD banks within a 15 minute walk walking distance of one corner and through that starting to have this insight into how the world was really operating what its assumptions were and so you know just like you said it was that ability to to talk about something that's hard to see and make it very relatable to where it's we can all see it we can walk around where we live and we're like oh and now i understand why this is happening um that i think was helpful to people and was the energy i was trying to build on and honor and uh, and and really try to make some of the forces that are driving our world a lot more tactile and something that we can talk about rather than just, you know, wonder about or not even see at all. Especially right now, like it feels, I feel like now more than ever, maybe I'm just more aware of it, but you have companies like, like Facebook, uh, like Google, you have these ginormous companies just commanding so much of the wealth in this in in the economy and in in the world and just so much power outside of just wealth and influence that this the the concepts that you're talking about in your book and kind of this sea change of how we approach what true success is for business and changing those things it feels really daunting because it feels like pushing uh pushing you know a boulder uphill uh to a certain degree like how i i i struggled with that in in reading the book you know there's so many times where i'm like yes like this absolutely Absolutely, this needs to happen. But man, this is going to take a lot of people all on the same team. And right now, I don't feel that. Yeah. Well, I think you know part of the part of the size of Facebook and Google is just these are the first companies to operate on a global scale. You know, in this kind of way. So a lot of it is like 
is about the kind of business they are matched with where we are in this moment in history. So in a way, we don't know yet whether Facebook, Amazon, I guess the actions, the political actions right now will kind of determine whether this is the normal from here on out or this is an aberration or what. Like it, I almost feel like we're still too early to know. Um, but one thing that makes me optimistic is that um, you know, the book argues that this implicit belief that the right choice is the one that makes the most money, that that's like the thumb on the scale of everything. Um, but I give examples of people who are thinking differently than that or acting differently than that and how those people tend to be rewarded. And, you know, it's in the world of business, weirdly, where kind of values are more broadly agreed upon as being real and having real impact than anywhere else. You know, like every company believes Every CEO believes in this idea that if they articulate certain beliefs or certain ways of doing things, that it materially affects the outcome of what they do. So I feel like the idea that a shift in values can have a material shift in how companies operate and the outcomes and really kind of what's happening in the world at large, I feel like that's not that hard of a sell. Um, it's just kind of about the competitive space moving to where the public demands it, to where, hey, all of our competitors are now becoming super sustainable companies who are doing X, Y, and Z things. We must now do that too or risk going out of business. So I think that there are ways where just there are new value spaces that become competitive and new notions of success start to enter the bloodstream. Um, but for large scale change to happen, like in, for instance, to affect the, the climate crisis, then we're gonna need state-based action, I think, for that to occur. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for both bottom up of people making different choices, organizations working towards different concepts of value, and then there being political solutions to try to address the ways in which just solely focusing on growing financial wealth has produced destruction and corruption in other areas of our society. Yeah. So this is just like a taste of, of kind of the big ideas uh, that, that you write yeah. about uh, in your book. This could be our future. Um, I thought we might start um, maybe beforehand. First, first of all, I feel like first and foremost, I need to thank you because I've funded personally two of my own music albums on Kickstarter over the past nice. six, six ish years, I would say, and very successfully so. And so it's not very often that I get to meet like one of the people who was instrumental to, to that. Like I, I'm, I'm very grateful for the work that you did with Kickstarter. And I think Kickstarter is just a phenomenal um, service that you provided. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to have thanked you uh, for, for that sort of thing uh, before because you you have really, you and your team at Kickstarter, when you were with Kickstarter, you enabled people to kind of take their dreams and turn it into something tangible. And I feel like there's there's an, there's a, definitely a, a huge thread that connects your work with Kickstarter and the concepts of the book. And um, yeah, so th those kind of intertwine. But uh, I don't know, like, were you, were you aware uh, early on that you wanted to create a business that would enable and empower people to create these things? Or how did that happen? Was it, <laughs> was it just something that surprised <laughs> you along the way? Uh, you know, it was, it was Perry Chen who first had the idea for Kickstarter. Um, and he brought myself and Charles Adler on board. And, you know, what Perry had initially had was basically the idea for crowdfunding, the idea of, uh, a conditional trigger of if a certain amount of money was raised, then a project would happen. If if the money wasn't raised, it wouldn't happen. Right. Um, but we all knew from the beginning that we wanted to focus this on creative projects, people making albums exactly like you, picking, people making movies. We saw the application for charitable projects or businesses, but that was just that wasn't what we were personally interested in. Um, and so we were we were hyper focused on this idea of this as a creative tool because the creative industry was limited by the idea of the only projects that should get funded are ones that could be a hit, ones that could produce a financial return. And, you know, we just saw that as being a, a limited way of looking at things. And, you know, the book, honestly, is making that same argument on a larger scale. It is. Um, but, but I saw with Kickstarter just like the degree of things that became possible. Like one of my favorite Kickstarter projects is a, a father and a daughter in Atlanta who raised a few thousand dollars to do a squirrel census in their park. 
And so they wanted to document all the squirrels in their park and they made a beautiful poster, like all 88 squirrels, you know, Chippy and whatever they whatever they were named. And, and it was like a, a really fun project. It got maybe a couple hundred backers. If you would imagine them going to uh, their local Bank of America to get a yeah. loan, you know, or any right. other way of funding this, there's no way it would happen. Um, and you know, but projects like that, if if there is excitement, if there's enthusiasm, like they should exist. You know, that that should be enough of a reason uh, to justify something. So that that was always the big win. And, and the irony is that there was a a giant scoreboard showing amounts of money on every page. Um, but money money was just just purely instrumental. You know, there there was no upside to it. It was just a kind of fuel um, that people were allowed to convert into whatever they wanted, a squirrel census or two records or, you know, I funded multiple projects myself. Um, and yeah, Kickstarter continues to be amazing. You know, it's it's such a great tool and space that's that's just there for creative people to do what they want with. And that that was the dream from the beginning. And uh, and at some point you know, Kickstarter moved into becoming a public benefit, uh, corporation, which again, kind of ties into this like greater good sort of thing here. W was that an honor when, when that happened? Like, like what, what motivated that? Well, you know, we were always, um, it was so important to us to like be a, not a Silicon Valley company. And, right. um, and, you know, we're New York based and, you know, and when when we started the company, Charles and Perry and I, we had told our investors, hey, we, we never want to sell the company or go public. We want to be like a, a public utility that just serves its purpose, is like sustainable, rewards rewards the people who helped make it, but isn't looking for like some big cash out payday. That's not success for us. And, you know, so we everyone was on board with that. But yet we were still operating within a traditional for profit structure which meant that, you know, legally, technically someone, a shareholder could sue us saying, uh, you know, you're not financially maximizing by doing X, Y, or Z things. And we knew that was unlikely, but it had happened to Ben and Jerry's before. And, um, and, and one of our, a partner at, at our one venture firm, Union Square Ventures, a guy named Albert Wenger, told us about this, the public benefit corporation models. It was becoming real. This was in 2013. And the idea that you could legally inscribe a, a mission that would force you to balance financial goals with non-financial goals. And those non-financial goals had to produce a, pu a public benefit. And so that was like absolutely in line with how we were thinking. And so the notion to legally inscribe those values to say legally prohibit the company from using legal but esoteric tax avoidance strategies um, was really attractive and meaningful to us because it's you're binding future actions. You know, these are these are forms of these are ways that money that companies eke out more profits for themselves, but ultimately compromise the greater good. And there's a huge right. cost when all companies are doing that. So, you know, the chance to be on the leading edge of that was was important to us. And just to be very clear that, you know, our values were not, you know, we're just not empty slogans on a cafeteria wall, but we were really, you know, challenging ourselves to 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 model what we thought the right behavior was. And that, you know, that's that's an ongoing process that that never stops. Yeah, indeed. Could any company uh, kind of figure out how to make the case uh, that they are a public, you know, they offer a public benefit uh, in order to get involved? It's, I mean, I feel with Ki with Kickstarter, it's an obvious like that. That's a that's yeah. a very obvious claim to make. But if if Facebook came out and said, "Oh, we want to do that too," like could they? Well, like, you you could imagine there's a version, but you know, I mean, think about like one of the most well known public good companies is Ben and Jerry's. I mean, they make ice cream. It's hard, you know. It's <laughs> like, there's a lot of delight in ice cream. It's so. <laughs> I, there is. They're so deeply intertwined that we don't think about it. But yeah. also it's like that's kind of strange. Yeah. Like what if a soda company, you know, is doing that, you know, sure. so um, it you know, there's this I think as the public, you have a sense of how how deep these things are for a company, how much they matter. And events put those things to the test. And, you know, this is this is not not easy stuff. But um, but yeah, just trying to think beyond the notion that that the right way to behave as a company is to make as much money as possible and then to do corporate giving where you go clean up a park once a week in exchange for a sign or you give money to charity later on after you cash out and make your billion dollars, that that's like the right way to behave. When companies behaving that way are exactly the reason why there's not enough money to clean the parks 
on its own. The reason why there has to be these charitable givings or why education is underfunded are exactly related to these profits that are then being donated in, you know, I think not as ideal ways. So rather than just participate in that system and try to do like the, the best version of that, instead it's opting out of that and trying to demonstrate that success can involve not a cash out. Success can involve a different notion of, of, of success. And, and honestly, that's how the world ran up until about 1970. This is actually quite recent that we have grown to believe that financial outcomes are all that matter. Um, and so hopefully, you know, hopefully Kickstarter can be a, an early green shoot of a, of a new mentality that Certainly, you know, I, I'm working with startups now. I advise a couple of startups and, they, you know, they're very driven by these kinds of ideas. Like this is it's what makes business relatable to them. The idea that they could be working for some larger purpose, but that a business is just the most efficient and powerful vehicle to do that. Yeah. Yeah. As, as you're talking about this, it, it uh, brings to mind kind of the often heard, you know, phrase from from people who, who run large tech companies about saying, yeah, well, we're making a difference in the world. You know, our work is, <laughs> is changing the world. And it's kind of hard to like feel that sometimes that uh, often that feels very ingenuous. It doesn't doesn't feel yeah. very, very sincere. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> it's very hard. It's very hard to believe in tech missions now. Yeah. You know, I'm like Kickstarter launching in 09, starting in 05, we're still, we're still when it was pure, when, when people believed in it. And, and I think it's hard, it's harder for people to believe in these missions now. And it's largely an emotional change. I feel like it's like the media, the media energy around it has changed. It's been a lot of it. And then I think the 2016 election is a lot of it for people. Uh, The two, the two companies I am working with that I would, that I would shout out, one is called Ren. W R E N, which is a carbon offsetting service. Um, and they're, um, great run by three, three young folks, uh, in California. And it's like you put in how much you travel, what kind of car you drive, and then you pay a certain amount of money each month to plant or protect trees to offset your usage. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, and so it's a, it's a very cool service. Uh, and then the other one I've been helping is called Ampled, A M P L E D. And they're, a Patreon-like subscription service for musicians, but they're a co-op. And so as a musician, you will own a piece of the company and the company will be controlled by its users. Profits will be distributed to other, you know, to other users of the platform, et cetera. So it's really trying to fundamentally rethink the ownership structures um, for platforms. And so that to me is like, you know, who knows how far that will get, but that is like kind of a holy grail of of uh, new radical structures for the web um so th- like both of those projects are ones that i'm like that you know that if if there's any ground to be gained here and if i can in any way be helpful that that seems like the right thing to do i love the idea uh well behind both of them but ampled is, is like I, I gotta in- investigate that a little bit deeper uh on my own because I, I, I am <laughs> nice. a musician, so you know maybe I could uh, participate. Give my, I'll give you my referral code, so I can get my- <laughs> <laughs> right on. I'm very curious to look into that. Uh, reflecting back on your time uh, with Kickstarter, uh, of course you co-founded it, and then later on you became CEO. Uh, I think you were CEO 2014 through 2017. Like when you yeah. look back on your time with Kickstarter. Uh, like, what are some of those moments that you find yourself really reflecting on? What are the things that really made an impact that you can look back and say, man, that was, things are going right? I mean, I, I mean, I'm smiling. I'm, I'm looking, I'm staring, I'm staring into the distance smiling. I, you know, my first thought are just the people, the people I, I got to work with, you know, the experience yeah. of being a part of a team, you know, all, all the, all the sort of cliches of working on hard problems together, you know, just like banging your heads against the wall with a group of other really smart people trying to figure something out. Like I, I, there aren't many things more fun than that. Sure. Um, and so I, I think about those kinds of moments, um, you know, different moments watching projects come to life. You know, I remember the first time I went to a restaurant that was funded on Kickstarter and just like how wild it was to think that this, you know, just like these, this digital ephemera produced this place. That's amazing. Um, yep. You know, the the day Double Fine Adventure launched is like a day I will forever remember. That was like a wild 24 hours. It raised a million dollars in 24 hours, but all kinds of other crazy things happened that day too. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I if I think about 
the moment when Perry first told me about this idea in like 2005 and I didn't love the idea at first. I told him it reminded me of American right. Idol. You right. know? <laughs> and, and thankfully he taught, he like, you know, conv- convinced me otherwise. Sure. But if I think about the journey from that moment to then where it got and, and what it still is, you know, I, I just feel uh, just overwhelmed with gratitude and 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 it you know it's 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 so cool it's 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 just the best and and it continues to be such a great service and um and you know i just i hope it can be that for all time i mean that that's that's the dream so you know it it was just a uh, an amazing experience in life that i you know was the hardest thing i've ever done and the most fun thing i've ever done and yeah. um and, you know and, until this really until this Right on. Cool. Yeah. Now, when I think of Kickstarter, like, and especially as I was reading the book and kind of thinking about like my own experience with Kickstarter, it just made me realize like how many interesting things would never have been if it weren't for this crowdfunding yeah. model. And uh, it may have seemed, you know, strange at first when you first heard about this, the idea behind it. Um, but I'm definitely really happy that it does exist because obviously one, there's one, huge value to people to be able to be yeah. involved and contribute and be a reason behind something existing. I, I, I remember the day that the Veronica Mars project launched yes. and I was in and Rob Tom, I'd worked with Rob Thomas, the creator of that show for two years to try to get that project to launch, trying to get Warner brothers to let him do it. And when it finally launched, Rob lives in Austin and I was there, I was there with him in his office and watches the project raise this. He had a $2 million budget that he'd been begging Warner brothers for, for eight years. And in less than eight hours, he raised that $2 million from the public. And I was <laughs> wow. sitting there in his office with him and he's Skyping with Kristen Bell, who is pregnant. And they're both like crying together over just this experience of they had believed that Veronica Mars was a great show that was like literally one of the lowest rated shows on TV, but had that cult following. And here they had this moment of like, they could really believe it. They could feel it. They could feel the love that existed for them. It was amazing. Amazing to sit there and see that. And that, that still, you know, that happens almost every day. Right. Yep. And so, um, everyone has their version of that, of, wow, I've put all this work in and I've, you know, what it's meant to anybody else has been super unclear. And it's and it's not often you get those moments as a creative person, but like it's one of those moments. It's it's one you have to earn, but it's like it's a real moment of like, wow, people do care about me. It um, really is. So it's yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's very fulfilling to put up the project and to finally get to that that day or that moment where you're like, cool, my my goal has been reached. This is actually happening. It's becoming yeah. a reality thanks to people who are just so kind uh, to contribute and and see kind of the benefit of the project as well along with you. Um, another thing that I really connect with uh, that you are uh, responsible for, um, the Creative Independent, which uh, I, I will admit I was very unaware of until my research uh, with this book and preparing for this interview, but I love it. It was kind of one of those things where I, I went to the site and saw all of these interviews with different creative people. I was like, where, ha- where where have I been that I didn't know this is, this existed? Because this is the, exactly the kind of stuff uh, that I love to to read and, and consume as a creative person. Um, I have to imagine in your time doing this and, and kind of helping uh, make this a reality, like there must be some sort of quality that you see like many of these creatives share, even though they're not doing the same thing. They're not all musicians. They're not all visual designers. But if you if you had to name like a quality that they all share, like what would that be? I mean, so much of the you know the creative independent is a it's a daily interview or essay with a creative person, and it's focused on the emotional and practical realities of being a creative person. And to me, it's it's I'm always interested in those um, those battles with the self. You know, convince, convince, convincing yourself to do something you don't think you can do or forcing yourself to be productive when you don't want to be productive, uh, balancing all the self-sabotaging voices you have. I, I love hearing how people relate to that. Um, there was one, one woman I really love. She's a painter and she talked about how when she goes into the studio, her painting studio, she imagines that she's like an Amazon fulfillment services worker with an 
this whole boss that's always screaming at her for like not working fast enough. <laughs> and like, and that's, and that's the energy she needs inside of herself to get her there best work. Go. She just like learned that's what I need to do. Yep. And so that, that kind of stuff, I just connect, I just connect with very deeply. Um, and you know, everyone who's like, be, being interviewed there, they know they know they're speaking to their peers. So I think people are are just super honest and super real. And um, yeah, it's 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 one of the things I'm I'm most proud of. Um, and it's yeah, it's 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 just an awesome service. It's like 800 people have contributed their wisdom, and the goal is to build the Wikipedia of the creative process, artist by artist. I absolutely love it. And and by the way, we didn't really talk about this much, um, or or really at all at the top of the interview. But prior to this life, you know, the Kickstarter life and, and, uh, writing this book and everything, you were a music writer. So obviously as a, I'm, a, I'm assuming as a kid, you were, you were a big music fan, saw the picture of you with your, your, your Walkman, uh, as mm -hmm. a kid, but were you a musician when you were younger as well? Or are you a musician? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. Okay. Yeah, I grew up. My my dad, my dad plays country and bluegrass and folk. He's a great guitar player. So I was brought up being taught how to play and I played with him. Um, but I, I play every day. I, I love it so much playing, playing guitar, making music is like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's wild, but like since, since, since no longer being a CEO, my like musicianship has increased amazingly. And it's not just from playing more. It's like, I, I feel, I feel more, more liberated in yes. my body. I don't know the ability to be expressive. It's, it's amazing. I can really feel it. My draw, like my drawing has changed tremendously. It's, it's, it's wild. Ah, I love how creativity works. It really gets me going. Um, this is awesome. We got to take a break. And then when we get back, we're going to talk about, I mean, obviously this is one reason why you're here. The other reason is, of course, the book that at least at the time of recording is not out yet. It releases in four days on October 29th. Is that right? Uh, but by the time this interview is uh, published, this book will already be out. This could be our future and uh, fascinating stuff here. So we're going to dive into the concepts and ideas in the book after this break. We want to thank LastPass for sponsoring this episode of Triangulation. LastPass is an award-winning security solution. Uh, I love it. I use it literally every day <laughs> on my life on the internet. Uh, it helps millions of individuals and over 43,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. And, you know, many people might think, that you know their you know their information is off limits no one cares about their information um and the reality is you're probably accessing different password protected accounts all over the place from your smartphone uh to your smartwatch to your laptop and and knowing those passwords can be difficult and so what a lot of people do they, they end up sharing the same password across all these places that makes them ultimately less secure that's not the right way to go. With the LastPass mobile app, you can continue to have the safety and security of logging in anytime, anywhere, and you still only need one master password that protects the LastPass account, but then all of your passwords at your different sites, you don't have to remember them because LastPass manages those for you and can you know, help you to be sure that they're all unique and, and powerful in and of themselves. Your LastPass account is backed up and synced across all devices for access to your passwords. No matter where you happen to be, all you have to do is download LastPass Password Manager from the App Store on your device. I have it on my Android device. You log in with the same LastPass account and that, that's going to sync over your data. And then there's an autofill feature on mobile devices that removes the hassle of typing on the small mobile keyboards. It's like when you enter into a field with an ID or password, it recognizes it, LastPass appears, a little pop-up, and you just say, yes, that's the password to use. And you might you know, authenticate, and boom, it's in there. You don't have to memorize it. Uh, you swipe into the LastPass app with your fingerprint. Like I said, it secures things, keeps things very secure, uh, keeps your passwords locked away and biometrically secured, and uh, keeps you safe. We use LastPass Enterprise here at Twit. The entire company is using LastPass, and we love it. Like I said, I use it every single day. Uh, and uh, I even got my wife to, to use it a couple of years ago, and she loves it as well. LastPass also has an expanded business lineup with some amazing features that will improve security across your company and make life easier for your users. So you want to check it out for yourself. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you that's lastpass.com slash t-w-i-t and we thank lastpass for their support of this episode of triangulation 
So, okay, so now you've ventured into, I mean, you've done writing before. You were a music journalist. You've done, I'm sure, a number, um, a, a lot of writing, but uh, writing a manifesto is, is a whole different uh, ball <laughs> right. of wax, I imagine. What, like, how, how do you prepare for something like this? Do you journal a lot? Do you, like, are you just in the habit of writing? It's really while we're yeah, yeah, you just swallow, you swallow hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, uh, I mean, I, I thought I could do this. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I, I just, I, I set a series of goals to work towards and sort of yeah. let myself either prove it or not. Um, and, uh, you know, it began by writing the first two chapters and kind of an outline. And, um, I started working with a, a literary agent who, like liked me, but wasn't so sure about my idea. And I thought that would be a great person to work with because he would be a good filter that wouldn't let me make a fool of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but you know, once I was sort of like committed to this project, I spent, um, I first spent about two months going to, a uh, apartment, a room in an apartment I rented on Craigslist where I had the internet disconnected and it was just an empty room with like a table in Chinatown. And I just sat there for two months and pretty much all I did was read. Um, I read a lot of the core economics texts that I wrote about. I tried to read a lot around those areas. I was very interested in reading about the history of how rationality has been defined, how self-interest has been defined. And I spent two months just putting index cards up on all the walls around me with everything I thought was interesting. And as well as like the, there's a lot of pop culture in the book, um, as well as those things that I was thinking about. And before really writing, I, I spent literally two months just living in that space, moving things around. And from that really created the structure of the book. Um, and then spent, it was, I guess about a year straight, like executing it. Um, and going chapter by chapter. And then after I finished the first half of the book, which is sort of all about the challenges of now, mm -hmm. and then the second half of the book is, is almost entirely forward looking and introducing a new idea um, called bentoism. Um, you know, I finished the first half of the book and then I, I very explicitly gave myself a six week break where I wasn't going to write anything, where I was just going to like let my brain go loose, just read again, kind of return to what I'd done before writing the book. And it was in that span of time that the framework of Bentoism emerged to me. Um, I already knew like the argument I was going to make, but I wasn't sure of the metaphor. And then, and then it all just sort of came in this period once again of just sort of exploration and living within the ideas. Um, so I, you know, I felt like I was building on um, theories that some books that really had a big impact on me that they had that they had talked about theorized uh, two philosophers one named michael walzer another named elizabeth anderson uh, who wrote about value and economics and and non-financial values and in, in ways that were really interesting um and you know and and i was try i was trying to build on those ideas and there's there's this vision that alan moore has of something called the idea space which is the notion that we have a physical world that we live in. Um, there's like a spiritual world where our souls are. And there's also something called the idea space, which is an, a space where ideas live. And that space is a, a real space above every one of our heads. There's like a thought bubble where our, our ideas live. But those thought bubbles have doors that can open up and our ideas can walk out onto the street and interact with other ideas. And they can ideas can enter our brain without us coming up with them on their own. And I always had this mindset that I was trying to listen to the idea space while writing this, that I was trying to immerse myself in these ideas, pair them with what I saw around me and what my instincts were about this story, and then just sort of to, 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 let, it, to let it reveal itself. And so I, I constantly felt like that's what I was doing. I was just allowing the story to tell itself and, and helping to shape it in a way that it was most snappy, it was most, you know, it's just everything extraneous cut out and, and really trying to get to the essence of, of, of what this argument is. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, from the beginning, it was, it was like I was compelled by a certain argument as well as like an emotion I wanted to create in a reader, a sense of seeing the world a new way. You know, uh, those books where you feel like you're taught a, a new way to look at the world that like, there's nothing more interesting than those. And I, I felt like I had the chance to do that. Um, and so I don't know. I was I I, I was on a mission. I, I felt a real compulsion, and I I knew what it needed to be, and and it 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 was always there, just revealing itself to me day by day. 
Yeah, and I think uh, the the way that you approach it, like you said, some kind of pop culture references. Obviously, Adele is in there, and you know a number of number of other examples that you're like, okay, well, why are we suddenly talking about Adele? But they, but what they ended up doing is a they crafted the concepts in a way that are easy to understand, and b they kind of kept things moving because I, mean, I haven't read a whole lot of of texts like this, you know, that that really mm -hmm. dive deep into kind of the the financial ramifications of where we are and and you know the, the mm -hmm. big the big theories behind how we change this and all this kind of stuff. It's not it's not the type of reading that I'm super familiar with, but there were enough of these kind of uh, th these references that you made throughout that made it really easy for me to connect with it, anyways. And I imagine it will for other people. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about financial maximization, and that's I think yeah. one of the key components of this book. That is the overarching. Uh, essence of what you're talking about, where we are right now, and potentially where where we would be best to kind of move away from. What happens if we don't shift away from this mentality, this this world of financial maximization that we are so um, so surrounded by right now? Well, if we you know if we continue to operate according to the belief that financial value is the only rational value, and that if we simply just build a large enough wealth base that we can solve everything. Um, you know, I think that's a world without many jobs. Um, you know, cause I think that that encourages a mindset of automation. Um, you know, I think that's a world where we try to solve the challenges created by automation with just by throwing money at it, which is what I think the universal basic income is, you know, mm -hmm. the, the right. of course the solution in, a, in an age where we think money is the most important thing that matters. The answer is to give away money. You know, um, and so I, I think that it, it produces an incredible wealth, prosperity and and a, and a total famine. And I think in everything else, an ecological famine, a, a social relational famine, a purpose famine. Um, and, you know, I it's to me, it's not a coincidence that of the world's 10 largest economies, five or six, I believe, have been stricken with a populist uprising in the last five years. Hmm. Right. It's the world's richest countries that are experiencing this. Right. And right. it's not it's not a coincidence. It's because the you know, they, it's called the Gini coefficient is how economists will talk about it. But the degree of inequality that exists inside of a of a nation state will reach a point where it breaks. You know, this is what's happened in Chile this, this past week where people burned down the, the power building for the country. Um, and so that's what happens if this stuff doesn't gets then get stopped like rich people will screw themselves with this short-sightedness you know the, the crazy thing about our economic policy since the 1970s is that if we just followed our previous trajectory we would have a government that was amply funded we would have an education system that was well funded rich people would still be rich just slightly less rich we probably wouldn't have the environmental decay that we have now it's a lot of like un a lot of own goals that we've been creating all to basically squeeze out another 20% of profits each quarter. You know, and that's really, I think that's really what we're getting. We're getting like another 20% of income through this mentality than what we would have otherwise. And so to me, European societies that offer a stronger social safety net, to me, that is a clearly more advanced way of thinking about this. Um, and, and you know, there you're just using taxes as a means to redistribute those profits to, to pay for social services that, um, that reduce the need for people to spend money on those things and therefore making them wealthier, even if it's not through financial wealth, but it's just by making sure that people are educated and are in a strong society. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are, you know, we're, we're heading off a cliff now. Um, and you know, if, I write in the book about a 30 year theory of change. I believe right. that 30 years is, is the right timeline to change anything. Like exercise as a hobby went from not existing to being super common in 30 years. Like exercise is still a new thing, it, it, <laughs> as weird as it is to imagine. That is weird to imagine, uh, yes. <laughs> in, in, in a modern context, it's still a new thing. In 1967, yeah. Strom Thurmond was arrested for jogging in South Carolina because it was so weird to run outside. Uh, that was 1967, that was 1967. <laughs> So like these things are newer than we think. Um, the challenge is the climate crisis. Uh, we don't have 30 years there. You know, we have maybe 10 years. And, and so that's going to accelerate our need to evolve. Now, maybe that's the forcing function that reveals that the need for us to elevate new values that like 
reducing the amount of carbon parts per millimeter, CO2 per millimeter in the atmosphere should be the most important value we're all working off of. You know, getting that from it's now 405, getting that back down to 350 where Earth is livable. Um, you know, maybe that's what emerges. Um, but yeah, on our current trajectory, there's just going to be a small amount of really rich people and, and then a, a lot of despair. It's Elysium. You know, it's, it's, it's that sci-fi movie. And that's the path we're on. That's the path we're on. And I think that's the path that the powers and be with at B are okay with. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think they mind that because they think they still win in that scenario. Sure. But all the rest of us should be saying, oh, hold up, hold up. Well, like, I, when did we decide that's the outcome? Yeah. You know? And in the, in the book you, you, you point out, uh, you refer to, you know, Gen Z and millennials being uh, <laughs> instrumental to this, right? Like the 30 year time span with with Gen Z and and millennials, you know, they're going to be the ones in power in thirty years. And so, so it, are the concepts in this book. I mean, I'm sure the concepts in this book are aimed for anyone who's willing to listen and read and learn from them. But do you think that they maybe resonate more with the with those generations versus the kind of the boomers and, and <laughs> that are are so deeply entrenched with this way of thinking right now that it's really hard to reverse the course. Yet you have Gen Z, millennials, these younger generations realize what you're talking about as far as you know the, the the climate is concerned and the need for change right now and not to just put it off until later yeah d definitely i mean it's it's always easier to solve your friends problems than your own right yeah. you oh, know, for when, sure. <laughs> when 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 it requires when change requires unwanted change within yourself we resist it you know and so um <laughs> I mean, in 1990, many of the issues that we're talking about didn't really exist, right? It, like, it, it had barely started happening. And so that 1990 was like, that was guns and roses ago. You know, that, <laughs> that's 30 years ago. That's guns and roses ago. Yeah. And that's when all of this has happened. Yep. Like the majority of CO2 that's in the atmosphere right now, that has happened since that point. It has been just us. Just us. There's no bad guy other than us. Like the, the brilliance of Extinction Rebellion is that they are a post blame, post shame, nonviolent organization trying to change this because it's like it was us that are that's doing this and are still doing this. And so someone like Greta Thunberg, she has the gift of a, a mind that lets her see very clearly. And she has, and she's born at a time where she can really see the world for where it is, partially because she didn't create it, right? So she can be, she can more honestly see the reality of it. And so I, I look at her as she is seeing a truth that the rest of us are still waking up to, um, but it's coming a lot sooner than we believe. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a deep believer in, in Extinction Rebellion and, and a nonviolent movement to try to stop this because the, we're currently on a path towards almost certain inevitable violence uh, as the effects of climate change just, you know, wreck their course across the world. And so the idea of people sacrificing th themselves to try to, in a nonviolent way to stop this now, I believe is like the most compassionate thing you could do. Like the last thing we should do is to, is to just give up, mm -hmm. you know, is just to accept this and say, oh, there's nothing we could do. After for 30 sure. years, we just ignored, we just ignored. Mm -hmm. And now we say, oh no, but there's nothing we could have done. You know, it is, our ancestors deserve better, and and our children deserve better. And it, it's it, it's it's shameful if if we continue to avoid taking responsibility for our own actions. Yeah, and when you talk about guns and roses ago, uh, I love that phrase. <laughs> um, I go back a, a few a few more decades to you wrote about Milton Freeman's uh, New York Times op-ed in the 1970s and how that captivated so many and how you know. To, to a large degree, that kind of paved the way for the mentality that we are in right now. Why did why was it so captivating to people at the time? Um, you know, it was in 1970, Milton Friedman wrote an essay arguing that businesses have no social responsibility other than maximizing profits. And, you know, it's it's a it's a powerful and simple argument. You know, it's like a hot take. You know, it's a totally hot take hot during take. a <laughs> super hot take. And and the economy ran into trouble right after that. It ran into trouble because of the cost of Vietnam War, the cost of the Cold War, and then the cost of the social programs that LBJ put in. And so the economy like ran into, you know, ran out of room there. Um, and, and so the whole economic model shifted. Like this is the same moment where the U.S. moved away from the Bretton Woods Agreement and the gold standard and where basically the United States is um, 
strategy of governance just became financial growth because the country started to become run on debt. And so you can only work running on debt as long as you're just keep making more money the following year so you can keep paying back the previous year's debt. So there was like a a certain moment where he got put on that course. Um, and yeah, it was just a moment where I think where I think there was a softness and a uncertainty, a belief that the way things were working was no longer working. And here was someone that had like a powerful and effective idea. And, and people went with it. And, and in large ways, I think we're following, we're still playing on these on these old playbooks, you know, Friedman's playbook, the game theory playbook, certain notions of human relatedness that are very deep, that we believe very deeply that maybe we shouldn't. You know, even something like the effect that the Stanford prison experiment has had on the popular imagination when now we come to find out that that's not even true, right? Like that, that those, that study was actually kind of faked uh, apparently. Um, and so I feel like we need models that are looking at what works about now, because there's a lot of things that are amazing about the world today. I mean, look at what we've achieved in the pursuit of financial growth. Like it's truly extraordinary. I'm kind of in awe of human achievement. Um, so what can we do if we're steered towards, um, a goal that makes a little bit more sense than just making as much money for myself uh, as quickly as possible, which is kind of the, the mindset now that just isn't, isn't going to work. Yeah. Unsustainable entirely. Now, um, in chapter five, which you title the trap, um, you talk a little bit about extrinsic goals and, and uh, focusing on purpose. And that resonated yeah. for me a little bit because I don't know if it's, you know, that, that I'm now, you know, I'm, I'm 44, so I'm firmly like in my middle age where I'm like, okay, what is my purpose? Am, am, I, right. am I living to my purpose? And right. uh, I think it's a real, a real big challenge for, for someone to know whether they're living uh, in their purpose, let alone creating a business that adheres to some sort of greater purpose outside of just making money. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if you have any advice or any thoughts on, on how someone in that position tackles that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do actually, I mean, I, I think, I think there are a number of ways. I mean, one is there's the idea, the philosophy I introduced in the book called Bentoism, right. um, is meant, is, is meant to, it's a, it's a guide to self-coherence. It's a way for you to understand your values and what drives you, what you want, what it means to make a positive decision for yourself. And and Bentoism is based on the concept that our self-interest isn't defined by just what we want right now, what we want and need right now, just how the world around us def defines self-interest. But our self-interest is also about future me, the older version of myself that's great and wrinkled and made all the right choices, what, what they want me to do, living up to the obituary I want to have. There's also now us of the people who rely on us and who we rely on. And there's also future us of the of the next generation, our children and everybody else's children, too. And so these are four distinct spaces of our self-interest. Now me, future me, now us and future us. And every time we make a decision, we affect all these spaces. All these spaces affect us. And so the book it, introduces this as a framework and a structure for thinking about where value lies and it explains how. Patagonia giving away proprietary information to their competitors fulfills a grows a future us value of sustainability. It is a rational, it's a choice in the rational self-interest, just a broader notion of self-interest than we currently define. And so I think that this notion of a, a bentoist view of self-interest is part of the answer. Um, and what I've been doing since writing the book, um, you know, the, the levels of terror of titling, of putting the word manifesto in a book you're writing in 2019, <laughs> yeah. coupled with an inv inventing a new ism, like <laughs> the lat layered on top, you know, you're already like, I'm, I'm hanging by a single helium balloon over the Grand Canyon. Um, and, and Bentoism so does I have started, a nice ring to it though. I will say that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it sounds like Shintoism. It's, <laughs> it's all, it's, it's just sound alike. It's classic marketing. Um, uh, no, but I, um, you know, I started giving workshops, uh, in people's houses here in LA. I've done uh, several in my house, a couple in other people's houses where without them having any context, I sort of teach the ideas of this book. And then I teach Bentoism and then I guide people through a process of filling out what's in their bento, of uh, finding what their values are, and letting them practice and make decisions using that and teaching what self-coherence is by doing that. And, you know, I was first 
doing these things just sort of to gut check with myself, like how, how crazy is this? Like, am I insane to be doing this? And, um, and it, it really, really connects with people. And, um, and so I've started experimenting now with doing them as zoom calls. Um, and, and I'm even, we'll be launching by the time this goes up, it'll probably be live bentoism.org, which is a website where you can go through similar experience. So I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this framework can make people feel closer to what that is for them. Um, and can reveal what a self-coherent choice is, what acting in their values means. And even for an organization to get a real compass of like how it is we are to behave if we are to fulfill our purpose, you know, and our values and living up to, to really what, what our responsibilities are. Um, whether Bentoism itself is like the exact vehicle through which this this gains ground, I believe strongly in this expansion of self-interest as as being the path that lets human beings keep growing and evolving and improving without tearing it all down. Um, and really, that that was the core goal behind the book. What is the optimistic case for how we evolve? How, what's the new knowledge we could learn that could allow us to apply the things that human beings are so great at, uh, having huge impacts, you know, organizing together to, to create things. How could that be driven in a direction that uh, is really to our long-term benefit? And so the, the book is born out of, a, uh, a, of a, a hope and a desire and a belief that that's possible and, and, and trying to lay what I think is like the first brick in maybe a new way of thinking about the world. Sure. Now, um, Touching back on sure is a great response to that. Sure is a great response. To that. Sorry, <laughs> your concepts are just it's so. Appropriate. It's appropriate. It's appropriate. <laughs> I know, which is not to not to belittle at all. Like the the concept and the goal. I what I had in mind was this question of, and it ties right in with what you were saying. This feeling of helplessness and changing this all. It it just feels so big. So I <laughs> that's probably where the sure comes from because I'm trying to trying to struggle to understand how you overcome that. And I, yeah. I, I think I think what you're talking about is true, right? It's laying the first brick. If it's a 30-year project, and, and sure enough, you know, it's going to have to be sooner than that, but uh, everything has to start somewhere. What I also wanted to touch back on was Adele, because I, I really loved how you kind of tied your example with Adele into Bentoism uh, in the book. So talk a little bit about how you draw that correlation. Obviously, Adele didn't have any of your uh, your bentoism insight at that point uh but talk a little bit about that she's my co she's my she's my co-writer uh <laughs> no um uh yeah it's uh, yeah um so Adele, Adele, and Adele's the gigantic UK pop star, most you know, most popular pop star in the world. And in 2014, she was going on tour. And when Adele goes on tour, she has this problem where her tickets immediately sell out, especially because Adele's a kind of a populist artist who likes to price her tickets at like 50 bucks a pop. Um, but the challenge is she sells them for that much and then scalpers buy them and then they get resold for hundreds or thousands of dollars more. And so Adele... Adele didn't like this because it meant she was either playing shows for rich fans or playing shows for people who are spending more money than they probably could afford to see her play. And rather than just accept this or go along with it, which artists can do, Ticketmaster and Live Nation have programs where artists get a cut of the scalp tickets uh, sales if they want to. Um, Adele found a, a startup called Songkick that had built an algorithm that would measure how loyal uh, a fan was to an artist. And so Adele's team used this to identify like the top 30 percentile Adele fans in each market and specially invite them to buy tickets, putting no restriction on whether the tickets could be resold, but simply on this idea that if they algorithmically optimized for fandom, it would produce a more communal and fair experience. And this ended up working. Less than 2% of those tickets got sold. It was estimated that fans sold million, fans saved millions of dollars that would, they would have paid to scalpers otherwise. And this sounds like Adele making a, a decision out of the goodness of her heart, but this is like a, a, a mathematical replicable choice. She used an algorithm to identify uh, who to sell tickets to and so found a way, found another metric to optimize her market on other than a financial return for herself. Instead, it was optimizing for a fairness for her community. And to me, 
that kind of idea, I call it an, an, an affirmative algorithm, but a way that we could use algorithms as a way to distribute need or to rethink uh, how goods are distributed in less financial ways, um, I think is, is going to be part of the future. It's going to make us probably feel really uncomfortable. And it's going to do a number of strange – it's going to involve a number of strange outcomes. But I think that that's, that's a likely answer uh, to how we'll solve some of these questions in the future. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Now, one of the companies that comes to mind when uh, when when I was reading through the book was Salesforce, Mark Benioff. He's very he's got very much like Salesforce is a company that's that's doing okay. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Salesforce making a good amount of money. Also a good kind of attention to social good and uh, and social change and everything. What what are some other uh, examples that you that you have? that you know maybe they haven't read the book necessarily but they're practicing what you're talking about here cuz i'm sure there are companies out there that are that are doing a good job of this already that can be an example for others yeah i mean the, the ones i write about in the book i write i write about patagonia and their pbc charter um committing them to uh sharing proprietary information with their competitors um you know a, an unlikely a, unlikely example i talk about is chick-fil-a um, and the fact that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays, it's the only major chain in America that's still closed on Sundays. This cost them a billion dollars a year. But six days out of the week, Chick-fil-A is a classic financially maximizing company. One day out of the week, there's something different. They're like a now us company that's thinking about their employees and families and tradition. And I think that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Kickstarter is an example of this, like becoming a public benefit corporation mm -hmm. where we're, we're like literally inscribing what it is we are to be held accountable to. And it's very much balancing these different sort of spaces of the bento. Um, what I really hope happens is that the bento can explain why it is certain organizations stand out, like why market leaders are who they are. Um, for instance, I think the bento explains the success of Amazon in a way, um, because most of the companies that Amazon are competing with are traditional retailers that are thinking about sort of their now me profits, like they are looking to sell goods at a lowest price as they can that customers will pay for that enable them to be profitable. And instead, instead, Amazon strategy is to maximize for customer satisfaction. So like they're maximizing for someone else's now me as a way to maximize their own now me, um, I think is, is like an interesting way to think about what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that this just suggests how it is that companies evolve. So to me, the notion of a company just producing tons and tons of profits that, you know, they're then finding, trying to find some good to do with, you know, that that's an interesting question of how to solve that, whether that should be solved through taxes or whether it's like we should encourage the investment of financial resources and non-financial resources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then it's like, what are the instruments to do that? Should that be done through companies or states or, or what's the right model going to be? Um, you know, I, I hope that, again, I hope that this is like an early brick in a, in a new way of thinking. And there are certain ways that this idea needs to be conjugated that my brain doesn't know how to do. Um, but that people whose brains are skilled in ways that mine are not, you know, might know how to take these ideas further or how to apply them into different spaces. And so I'm hoping to connect with those people. And, and I'm arguing in the book, I'm making the case to smart young people or anybody that instead of devoting your life to helping a company financially maximize for itself, uh, consider devoting your life to the definition of new values and to thinking about how we might define the values of the future, what it would mean to build an economy around minimizing carbon emissions. Like how, how would we structure that? How how would that be a metric that we're all thinking about? Is that doable? What, what are the steps to get there? Because I think those are the kinds of solutions that where you're not requiring people to everyone to suddenly get woke or to like have yeah, certain yeah. goodness in their hearts or anything like that. Like if you're relying on that, that's that's you're you're gonna be waiting a long time. So how can you how can you turn those emotions or desires into unemotional uh, unemotional ways of thinking? And, and and that and that's how I think change can can really occur at a mass mass scale. I love it. I love I love everything that you've written here. Uh, this could be our future, a manifesto for a more generous world. I just think you've you've got a lot of concepts in here that are that are really need to be understood at this moment. There's there's a whole lot going on right now, and we could really uh, do ourselves a big favor and our children, like you say, uh, a favor by 
analyzing this stuff through a different lens, and that's what this uh, book is all about. Uh, Yancey Strickler, really, I, I'm just super honored to get the opportunity to sit down and chat with you today. Thank you so much for hopping on to Triangulation this morning. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And best of luck with the success of your book. Uh, yeah, everybody should definitely check it out. Triangulation records every Friday. We uh, do the show every Friday right around 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. Uh, you can go to twit.tv slash TRI for triangulation. You can find all of our past episodes there as well as this one. And I would recommend while you're there, you know, just hit one of those buttons to subscribe. That way you don't have to think about seeking out the episode or going to the site to, to play it there. You know, through, that's what podcasting is all about. Through the magic of podcasts, it just delivers to you. And you probably already know that, but sometimes it takes a nice little reminder to get you to do it again. So uh, we appreciate uh, each and every one of you listening each week. And uh, until next time, I'm Jason Howell. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye, everybody.